The Inside Passage, a network of channels snaking between the islands of the Pacific Northwest, stretches more than a thousand kilometers from Skagway, Alaska to Seattle, Washington. It is among the most heavily trafficked sea lanes on the American West Coast, allowing ships to travel up and down the coast while avoiding the hazards of the open ocean. However, the Inside Passage is not without its own unique dangers. 150 kilometers north of Victoria, British Columbia, lies Seymour Narrows, an 800 meter wide channel between Quadra Island and the east coast of Vancouver Island. With treacherous currents capable of overtaking even the largest ships, the Narrows were described by Royal Navy Captain and Explorer George Vancouver as, quote, one of the vilest stretches of water in the world. But beneath the channel's turbulent waters lurked an even deadlier hazard. Ripple Rock, a 200-meter-long underwater mountain with jagged pinnacles like twin fangs, which over the course of a century sent dozens of ships to the bottom. Then in 1953, the decision was made to destroy this maritime nemesis once and for all. What followed was one of the most impressive engineering projects of the 20th century, culminating in one of the largest non-nuclear explosions in history. Just before we get back to Simon looking at the largest man-made non-nuclear explosion, you know what could help explode your business? Today's sponsor, Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes your website look like you hired a whole design team when really it was just you at 2 a.m. not even wearing any pants like me when I record these videos. So whether you want to showcase your tutoring service, a research blog, a consulting side hustle, selling your custom-made Simon Whistler marionette dolls, whatever it is, Squarespace can help. You start with their blueprint tool, your personal site building sidekick, answer a few quick questions and it generates a custom layout to match your goals. From there, you've got access to a full library of award-winning templates, each one professionally designed, fully customizable and ready to go. Fonts, colors, layouts, it's all drag and drop and done. Whether you're creating an e-commerce site, informational blog, whatever it is, they do that. Key from there is that people can actually find your site and Squarespace has got you covered too, baking in SEO tools like meta descriptions and auto site maps so your site doesn't just sit there, it gets seen. And once you're live, keep that momentum going with built-in email campaigns. You can schedule updates, share resources, or check in with your audience, all without juggling five different tools or services. You don't need to be techie, you just need an idea, Squarespace handles the rest. Go to squarespace.com forward slash brain food for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, use offer code brain food to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Squarespace, build it your way, make it look brilliant. Now let's get back to Simon talking about humans blowing things up because we can. The first recorded victim of Ripple Rock was the American paddle steamer USS Saranac, which in 1875 was assigned to collect natural curiosities for display at the 1876 Philadelphia International Exhibition. As the ship approached Quadra Island, crew member Charles Sadelik wrote in his journal, quote, I have never seen an inland body of water more threatening than Seymour Narrows. Even the ocean in temper has no such ravening aspect. Indeed, local pilot William George warns the Saranax pilot, Walter Queen, to wait for the high tide before attempting the passage. Alas, Queen ignored his advice, and at 8.45am on June 18, 1875, Saranax struck the submerged pinnacles of Ripple Rock, as Sadalek later recalled, quote, when, in the midst of a whirlpool, the ship refused to answer her helm and was for a moment beaten about by the angry water, when all of the sudden there came a crash that shook the ship as if it had been fired by a battery of guns. The fearful rush of water as it closed over her was so powerful that it would have killed any living being who might have been aboard. Fortunately, the crew managed to run the ship aground on Vancouver Island and climb safely ashore, but the Saranac soon flooded and sank in 300 feet of water. Over the next 100 years, Ripple Rock and its giant whirlpools would sink another 120 ships, damage countless others, and claim the lives of 114 people. The hazard force ships attempting to cross Seymour Narrows to wait for the short half-hour window of slack tide every day, leading to considerable delays and pile-ups along the inside passage. Despite the significant danger posed by Ripple Rock, for decades there was significant reluctance to demolish it, for Seymour Narrows was thought to be an ideal site for a rail bridge connecting Vancouver Island and the mainland. It was not until 1943, when the United States expressed concern over the safety of ammunition ships bound for Alaska, that the first concerted demolition attempts were made. The plan involved mooring a drilling barge over the middle of the channel and drilling boreholes into the top of Ripple Rock. These holes would then be filled with explosives, allowing the rock to be blasted away piece by piece. Unfortunately, the barge proved no match for the powerful currents of Seymour Narrows, with an anchor line snapping every 48 hours. Eventually, the mooring system failed entirely, and the barge was swept into the whirlpool, killing nine men and causing the project to be abandoned. 
Another attempt was made in 1945 using a more sophisticated system of overhead mooring cables, but the currents made drilling difficult, and only 139 of the 1,500 planned holes were bored before this attempt was also abandoned. Ripple Rock sat undefeated until 1953, when the Department of Public Works decided to have another go at demolishing it. Many different demolition methods were proposed, including the use of naval torpedoes, earth-penetrating earthquake bombs, and even nuclear weapons. One less insane, but still ambitious proposal involved the use of a submersible caisson, like those used for building underwater bridge piers, which would be anchored to Ripple Rock with a skirt of ice generated by a mixture of alcohol and frozen carbon dioxide. In the end, however, Canada's National Research Council decided to attack Ripple Rock not from above, as had been tried before, but from below. The plan was straightforward but ambitious. On nearby Maud Island, a shaft would be sunk 200 meters straight down into the bedrock and a tunnel driven 800 meters across the channel to the middle of Ripple Rock. Twin shafts would then be raised within 40 feet of the summit of each pinnacle, and a network of small horizontal tunnels or coyote drifts evacuated for the placement of explosives. In 1955, contracts were awarded to Dolmage and Mason Consulting Engineers, Northern Construction Company, J.W. Stewart Limited, and Boyles Brothers Drilling Company, and shortly thereafter, a team of 75 experienced hard rock miners set up camp on Quadra Island. The excavation was slow and arduous, taking nearly three years to complete. As the geology of the area was not well understood, the miners had to drill exploratory boreholes as they went to gauge the rock conditions ahead. Thankfully, the bedrock proved solid, with only a short section of the 800-meter tunnel having to be shored up. Once inside the pinnacles themselves, the going was slower still, as the design of the coyote drifts and quantity of explosives required depended on a thorough understanding of Ripple Rock's actual shape. As the sonar technology of the time was not accurate enough for the task, the miners were forced to measure the rock from the inside. This was done by drilling hundreds of boreholes out from the coyote drifts until seawater started leaking through. I mean, what could go wrong with that? Then, from the depths of these boreholes, the outer contour of Ripple Rock could be worked out. By early 1958, the excavation was complete, and the miners began packing the drifts with nearly 1,270 metric tons of Nitromex 2H, an explosive composed of 92% ammonium nitrate, 4% aluminium powder, and 4% TNT. As Ripple Rock lay beneath 7 meters of water at low tide, nearly 10 times more explosives were acquired than for a blast on dry land. To allay public concerns about the volatility of such massive quantities of explosives, photographer Bill Roseboom, hired by Dolmage and Mason to produce a documentary on the project, filmed a series of increasingly extreme safety tests. Quote, we drove bulldozers over the Nitromex, we shot it with high-powered rifles, tried to set it on fire, shock it with static electricity, etc. But the only thing that would trigger this stuff was something called Primacord. Despite this, rumors spread up and down the coast that the explosion and accompanying tsunami would destroy the town of Campbell River 40 kilometers away and kill millions of fish and whales. Nonetheless, the countdown was continued as planned, with the event taking something of a carnival atmosphere. One enterprising group of locals even organized a bus service to take tourists to a nearby viewing point, charging $1 a head. However, this operation was shut down by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police as they began clearing a 5km radius around Ground Zero for safety reasons. They also advised locals living outside the exclusion zone to open their windows so they would not be smashed by the blast wave. Meanwhile, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation sent camera crews to film the explosion from the control bunker at Campbell River, the demolition being among the first events to be broadcast live across the nation. And so it was that on April 5, 1958, at 9.31am Pacific Time, the firing button was pressed and a massive blast rocked Seymour Narrows. The explosion, timed to coincide with mean low tide to minimize the resulting tsunami, displaced nearly 368,000 tons of rock and 317,000 tons of water, or about 88 million gallons or 330 million liters, and sent debris flying upwards of 300 meters into the air. At the time, it was the largest planned non-nuclear peacetime explosion in history, only exceeded on October 21, 1966, by the construction of the Madhu Mudflow Control Dam in Almaty, Kazakhstan, which involved the detonation of 3,600 tons of explosives. When the debris had settled, sounding crews determined that 15 meters had been blown off the top of the South Pinnacle and 23 off the North. This increased the clearance at low tide to 14 meters, deep enough for even the largest ships to sail over. The demon of Seymour Narrows was no more. Today, thousands of ships ply the channel every year, making many unaware of the deadly hazard that once lurked beneath the surface. And now how about a bonus fact, this time featuring exploding animals. 
Whales are among the largest animals to have ever lived, with the blue whale holding the record at upwards of 173 metric tons. Thus, on the rare occasion when a dead whale washes ashore, it tends to cause major problems for the authorities. Not only due to the massive bulk and nauseating smell, but also for the little problem of the whale tending to explode. Like most animals, when the whale dies, the bacteria in its gut starts to process it from the inside out, creating gases that swell the carcass to the point that it bursts. This is exactly what happened on January the 29th, 2004, when a 17-meter sperm whale washed ashore at Tainan City, Taiwan. The animal was lifted onto a trailer and was being driven to the Sutsal Wildlife Reservation area for necropsy when it suddenly exploded in the middle of a busy city street, showering some 600 onlookers in rotting blubber, blood, and whale guts. But not all whale explosions are caused by natural processes. One bizarre incident in 1970 involved rather more human intervention and would, for better or worse, help put a small Oregon town on the map. On the morning of November the 9th, 1970, beachcombers near the town of Florence, 200 kilometers south of Portland, stumbled upon a 14-meter-long, 7-ton sperm whale carcass that had washed ashore the night before. While the massive corpse quickly attracted a crowd of curious onlookers, they were just as quickly repelled by the rapidly worsening smell, and the local authorities were called in to deal with the problem. Curiously, at the time, beaches fell under the jurisdiction of the Oregon Highway Division, who placed 41-year-old engineer George Thornton in charge of the cleanup. According to Thornton, he was only appointed because his supervisor, District Engineer Dale Allen, took off hunting when this thing broke, conveniently, I think. To be fair, they had already planned on going, but this thing made them all the more anxious to go. Left holding the bag, Thornton set about determining how best to dispose of the reeking mountain of blubber. The corpse couldn't be buried, as the tide would quickly uncover it, and it was too large to burn. Nor could it be simply cut apart, for the simplest reason that no volunteers could be found who wanted to do so. After consulting with the U.S. Navy, Thornton finally settled on a solution, dynamite. The idea was to blow the corpse into smaller, more manageable pieces that could then be cleaned up by crabs, seagulls, and other marine scavengers. But how much dynamite to use? As no formal guidelines existed for this type of operation, Thornton was forced to use his intuition and settled on 20 cases, or about a half a ton. But as luck would have it, on the beach that day was local gun store and range owner Walter Eumenhofer. Eumenhofer, who had received explosives training during World War II, informed Thornton that 20 cases was far too much and that 20 sticks, or around 4 kilograms, would be sufficient. Unfortunately, Thornton was none too keen on a bystander telling him how to do his job, and Eumenhofer's expert advice was ignored. Because honestly, when have experts ever been right about anything in their respective fields? I mean, as every good internet citizen today knows, training and experience count for nothing next to good old-fashioned Facebook headline research. But going back to exploding whales, in an interview 25 years later, Umenhofer stated, But the guy says, anyway, I'm gonna have everyone on top of those dunes far away. I say, yeah, I'm gonna be the furthest SOB down that way. The blast was set for the afternoon of November the 12th, and a crowd of around 75 bystanders gathered to watch from the nearby dunes. Covering the event was cameraman Doug Brazil and anchor Paul Lindman of KATU-TV Portland, whose broadcast was soon to become legendary. The dynamite went off at 3.45 p.m., sending a fountain of smoke and blood 100 feet into the air, which Lindman described as resembling a mighty burst of tomato juice. In Brazil's footage, the spectators can be heard cheering for a brief moment before, to everyone's horror, a series of slapping sounds is heard as chunks of the carcass begin to rain down on the beach, turning, in Lindman's immortal words, land blubber newsmen into land blubber newsmen. For the blast blasted blubber beyond all believable bounds. So powerful was the blast that it sent pieces of the whale flying upwards of a half a mile away. One piece of blubber, the size of a car tire, flattened the roof of a brand new Oldsmobile belonging to none other than explosive expert Walter Eumenhofer, who had purchased the vehicle at a dealership sale called, and we can't make this stuff up, get a whale of a deal. Yet despite the massive explosion, the whale was still mostly intact, the dynamite having only carved out a small section of the carcass. Where still, the seagulls, which were supposed to clean up the remains, were nowhere to be seen, having been frightened away by the blast. Thornton was thus forced to send in the highway division workers with earth-moving equipment to clear away the remaining pieces and bury them elsewhere on the beach. Nonetheless, Thornton was optimistic about the operation, later stating in an interview with the Eugene Register Herald, It went just exactly right, except the blast funneled a hole in the sand under the whale. 
He then added, I said to my supervisors, usually when something happens like this, the person ends up getting promoted. And sure enough, about six months later, I got promoted to Medford. But the situation was best summed up by Linman, who ended his broadcast with, It might be concluded that should a whale ever be washed ashore in Lane County again, those in charge will not only remember what to do, they'll certainly remember what not to do. The current policy of the Oregon State Parks Department with regards to beached whales is to bury them on site or, if the sand is too shallow, to take them to another beach. The exploding whale of Florence soon became part of Oregon folklore and as the years passed the incident began to be regarded as little more than an urban legend. But the story took on a life of its own two decades later when it came to the attention of humorist Dave Barry who recounted it in a May 20th 1990 edition of his column in the Miami Herald. The article, titled The Far Side Comes to Life in Oregon, contains such gems as the responsibility for getting rid of the carcass was placed upon the Oregon State Highway Division, apparently on the theory that highways and whales are very similar in the sense of being large objects. And there was no sign of the seagulls who had no doubt permanently relocated to Brazil. As well as, but this is no time for gaiety. This is a time to get a hold of the folks at the Oregon State Highway Division and ask them, when they got done cleaning up the beaches, to give us an estimate on the U.S. Capitol. An uncredited version of Barry's article soon began to circulate on the internet, leading many to believe that the incident had only recently taken place. According to Ed Shopes, Public Affairs Coordinator for the Oregon Department of Transportation, We started getting calls from curious reporters across the country right after the electronic bulletin board story appeared. They thought the whale had washed ashore recently and were hot on the trail of a government blubber flub-up. They were disappointed that the story had 25 years of dust on it. Despite Shope's endless clarifications, the calls kept coming in and Shope's office soon became known as the Blubber Hotline. I still get regular calls about this story. It amazes me that people are still calling about this story after nearly 25 years. 50 years later, the exploding whale still evokes mixed feelings for those who were there. George Thornton remains convinced that the operation was a success but had been spun into a public relations disaster by hostile news reporters. When contacted by Paul Lindman in 1995 for his book, The Exploding Whale and Other Remarkable Stories from the Evening News, Thornton declined to be interviewed, stating, Every time I talk with the media, it tends to blow up in my face. Thornton retired from the Oregon Department of Transportation in 1990 after 43 years of service and died in 2013 at the age of 84. While initially unimpressed by the mockery the exploding whale brought to their town, the residents of Florence eventually came to embrace the whole thing even in June of 2020, voting for a new recreational area to be created, Exploding Whale Memorial Park.